Thank you. So, yeah, WebAssembly. So, yes, ironically, there is assembly in the project, though WebAssembly is not exactly the same as assembly. I don't have, I that part alone is a talk. <laughs> but um, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, because this is Go, I'll, I'll talk about um, how you can extend Go with uh, WebAssembly to run other code inside of your app. Um, but uh, basically, um, I'm coming here uh, uh, from uh, Tetrate, where I work at, and I, I work full time on uh, uh, Wazero, which is a WebAssembly library. So you can import it just like you can import a normal uh, library inside of your Go app, like fast HTTP or protobuf or whatever. It's just a, a library. And um, this, this gives you a WebAssembly runtime. So hopefully by the time the talk is over, you'll know what that means. <laughs> um, and my GitHub name is Code from the Crypt. Um, and that's kind of a joke on a, um, a TV program uh, called uh, Tales from the Crypt. Because uh, the crypt is like a graveyard. And, um, and the Crypt Keeper is the one who's telling horror stories. And I feel like code sometimes is a horror story. So I feel like if you want to see some horror stories, you can look at my code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can also see me on Twitter if you like. I guess it's X now, uh, but uh, <laughs> no birds. <laughs> uh, I actually l worked at Twitter before, back when it was birds, but I don't. Um, and uh, yeah, so enough about me. The agenda, we're going to talk about safely running uh, code uh, inside your, your Go application. So one of the things that's pretty cool about most Go um, software is that you can do this thing, uh, statically compile a binary, and then uh, you can run it basically anything that Go can compile for, which is quite a lot of things. Um, but uh, one side effect of that is it, it has actually a limited plugin story. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of those details. Um, most of the time WebAssembly had in the p past years was focused on web, like web browsers, like how you do JavaScript integration. And so this is not going to be a talk about uh, web browsers. Uh, I'm sure there's someone who's cleverly written a web browser in Go, but I'm not that person. <laughs> this is only back-end stuff. Uh, so, um, and everything I speak about today is, is using the library that I'm talking about uh, for, for doing real work. So this is not just a uh, talk about hello worlds per second or any other fun things like that. Um, the way I will do this presentation is uh, from abstraction level high to low. So start with a service level abstraction, uh, things that are related to that, and then go into like containers and an application and like profiling. And even though this is a Go community, you know we always have different abstractions that we're thinking in, and hopefully this can help um, also relate this foreign topic called WebAssembly in many different ways. So let's start with service architecture. And so um, the premise here is that um, a lot of infrastructure software is written in Go. Uh, so like Istio, if you've heard of that, is written in Go. There's a lot of software um, proxies and all sorts of things that are written in a Go programming language. And there's one thing about um, infrastructure software is that it's actually kind of hard to change um, because it lives at a different software lifecycle than the applications that are deployed to it. So if you have a platform for running functions, that is still software. It still needs to be upgraded. Um, but that's at a different speed than maybe your application code or a different, um, different process or different people even. Um, and uh, you can think of service architecture having some things uh, that are in common regardless of what you're doing, whether you're doing a s uh, infrastructure code or normal code. We've had these, these uh, things in the past about uh, modularizing. I don't know how to make that thing go away. Does anybody know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Good. Yeah. That, is that on me? Anyway. Um, so I drew some boxes, uh, and you know, so we used to hear of this term called monolith. It's okay; it's not too much. Um, 
I don't even know what it says. <laughs> Hopefully nothing bad. Okay. Uh, so we have a big application, you know, and in the past people say break the monolith, and that means usually you take some part out and then you 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 move it somewhere else. And so we heard about protocol buffers. You could use that as a way to establish the contract between two places, at least the data model, or maybe also the service definition between them. And then you could now um, reduce the reduce the size of, of the big app by um, by establishing that contract and communicating remotely. Um, of course, gRPC is really fancy, and you can do things like local domain sockets. But let's just say the nature is kind of like a remote service call most of the time. The other thing that you can do, and let's see if my little animation works, yay, uh, is that you can uh, you can actually split code out of your repo and then put it back in again, <laughs> because uh, WebAssembly uh, instead of being a service, it's actually a guest. So it's like a, a small program that you've compiled, but then you can actually run it. Eh, you can run it inside the the application daemon that you've written in Go. So it's a local communication. It's not remote. It's uh, y it's just uh, you know like any other library. It, it doesn't. You can't even tell it's running. So let's say um, if I look at this and I'm using Unix command tools, I can see uh, lsof or netstat. I can see network communication sockets open. Um, it's very hard to even tell if someone is using WebAssembly because it's just a library. It's an application layer. So. That's one very interesting thing that you could actually separate the code repository of a function, like a plugin, um, but it can still run local in the process. So this is remember we're talking uh, service abstraction now. I'm not I'm not telling you the lines of code that do this yet. <laughs> You'll get it. So anyway, um, here we talk about API, like uh, application programming interface API. There's a term for how um, com compilers communicate called A, B, I, uh, binary interface, B for binary, okay? So um, when you're talking WebAssembly and really uh, specific ways, uh, they'll say A, B, I. Now on some of my slides, you'll see little things on the right-hand corner. So this is a project by, uh, has anyone used a, something called Trivi for vulnerability scanning, Trivi? Uh, no one yet, okay. So it just basically checks to see if you have some vulnerability in your application. It's actually written in Go. It's a monolithic application. <laughs> and um, the same uh, primary author, uh, I guess, is there a place I can publish slide? I'll do it, and then I'll share with you, and then you can share. Um, this is a GitHub <laughs> URL. Uh, Go plugin. And Go plugin is actually um, a way to do, uh, normally, it will use protocol buffers, uh, the HashiCorp Go plugin. But this person um, has written an alternative Go plugin that can either use gRPC or WebAssembly. So that means you can mark it up in, uh, as protobuf services, but in reality, it's actually implemented in WebAssembly. So that's kind of cool. So you can, I like these type of projects because you can uh, learn without too many things changing at the same time. So if you're already familiar with uh, protocol buffers or gRPC services, you can use something like this and then know what's the difference without starting from very low level. Okay, let's go into uh, an example of uh, something that tends to be monolithic, sidecars. How many people have heard of sidecar? Sidecar? Okay. Uh, so a lot, but um, basically the premise is a sidecar is an application daemon that sits usually on the same host, like the local host. And uh, one common fun functionality is they offload uh, common communication services. Like, so if you need a TLS, a mutual TLS authentication, instead of making your application have to do that configuration logic, the sidecar would do it, and then your application would actually talk to the sidecar, and it would just do these low-level tasks for you. Um, so they're cool. They actually allow you to focus more. Uh, your business uh, code doesn't have to change for infrastructure reasons as much. 
But um, the sidecars themselves are trickier to change. Sometimes they're provided by a vendor. Sometimes the vendor has specific versions that are allowed to be supported. They may be different than, um, than your application. There's a, a network proxy called Envoy. And this is, this is typically used with the Istio project. And if you ever use this project, you'll notice that the versions that are allowed to be used together is a very narrow uh, amount of versions. And so if you need to change, you may have to get into the world of a custom build or some other complexity, or you just live with that constraint. Um, another sidecar is an um, a application framework called Dapper. And that one is more, more types of features than just network proxy. It can do um, like an enterprise service bus kind of functionality as well. Um, but um, in the case of both of these, well, more so the latter, it's a, a static binary. So when you say in uh, Go, if you, uh, before you used to say uh, C Go enabled is zero to make it static. Now it's default uh, to static compilation. It means you can't actually uh, load any libraries dynamically. So if you want to extend it, you have to use a different way. Let's talk about extension reasons. Uh, so if I said like the side sidecar is going to provide some services for you, maybe uh, instead of your middleware having filters inside of your app, which then you would need to recompile your app to change your filters, then you could have common filters or functionality that are in the sidecar instead. The sidecar configuration could be the same for the whole company. And then you don't have to go and like change the Go app and the Ruby app and all these other apps in different ways. So uh, cool thing is you're moving to configuration approach for some low level stuff. And the penalty you pay is you have to install something and run it. And, uh, but of course things like Kubernetes and things help with that. Um, but basically the traffic will go through, you know, exit through here and then out the other way. And if you have middleware to do authentication or add a uh, header or something, this other thing can do that work. But you used to be able to control everything in your app, and now you're using this thing. So let's say you need to actually change something that is not supported in the sidecar. But you need to change it before it gets to you. <laughs> this is a very common problem with edge computing, uh, that you have something out there that uh, handles responsibility, but you need to change one small thing, and it's, it's hard to do. So um, this is the main conflict of um, of using third-party software, really, <laughs> uh, is that you want you want the benefit of not maintaining something, but you also want to change it. <laughs> um, so in uh, WebAssembly, we can kind of uh, tease this apart, and I'll talk about the story of this. So, like I said before, like network services have API, uh, WebAssembly uh, has an ABI, which is a contract between uh, the host, in this case. The host would be an application like Dapper's binary, uh, and your app, which is your your code that you want to run in there, and it's it's kind of like an IDL, is function signatures uh, that can be defined. So um, there is a middleware uh, filter um, system in WebAssembly that's called HTTP WASM. So WebAssembly is sometimes uh, they say WASM. Uh, instead of WebAssembly. So sometimes you'll hear someone say WASM or WebAssembly and they mean the same thing. Um, so just get used to that. <laughs> um, but if you think of this in terms of, uh, of Go programming, you have, um, uh, you know, many times you pe people will have a, a net, uh, you know, a net HTTP middleware that they use to provide common functionality. So that's something that you may want to plug in. And so if you are using WebAssembly, the cool thing is, is that you could actually change the middleware, load it into the proxy, but the proxy never has to change because the proxy is, is accepting anything with this ABI, uh, and so it can, it can load anything compatible with that. So in the case of Dapper, um, what happens there in that sidecar is it doesn't matter where you put the filter, but it's just configured just like any other filter. So sometimes a filter just says add this, like literally text, add, add proxy uh, header, blah, blah, blah. 
or um, anything else. And then so in its markup, which you cannot see, it says what is the type of the component, in this case is HTTP WASM, and then what is the URL to get that binary that's actually encapsulating the logic. And so that's file colon slash slash, but it could be HTTP, so it could actually pull down remotely your own thing uh, that you've, you've compiled somewhere else. So effectively, the WASM binary, which is a file that ends in dot WASM, dot W-A-S-A-M, sorry, W-A-S-M, <laughs> uh, that is the logic of the filter. So you can have your own code repository for your common filters, also your apps, you control them, but you use your uh, third party can run that code. And so this is, um, this is a very interesting uh, integration. And so th yeah, this is currently in use. Um, the uh, current SDK is for Go is actually using something called TinyGo. Anyone use TinyGo before? So uh, not, it's not very common. <laughs> so TinyGo was made for um, uh, like small devices, like uh, you could you could have um, your Raspberry Pi, uh, even uh, people who are making like old old consoles and things. It's for small places, so tiny like small code. And Tiny Go was the first compiler for the Go source per source language to support uh, WebAssembly, and it's the most featured one. But I will also talk about the normal Go a little bit later because we're still at the service abstraction. But I teased you because I tell you tiny go because this is just an example of an SDK that can uh, be used in order to compile code to like this. You'll also hear guest because uh, in um, when you talk about virtual machines, uh, uh, common jargon is like host and guest. <laughs> so the guest is like the third party code uh, that you've made or someone else made for you. Um, and uh, so you'll also hear the code uh, called guest sometimes. Uh, Dapper also has some things like integration, like uh, connecting Twitter to Twilio or other things like this. And so um, they now also have a way to have what's called an output binding of WebAssembly. So anything that could um, have basically like a main program that accepts arguments and standard input, standard output. If you compile a normal shell program kind of uh, to WASM, then uh, you can also use that as for arbitrary, uh, arbitrary stuff. So that's another way to do it. Um, now I'm going to talk about something probably no one's heard of called Kubernetes. And uh, <laughs> so Kubernetes is like workload manager. Um, and it's very common for cloud services uh, to, to um, you know, allow you to, to handle um, your service deployments and everything. But one thing about anything that does workloads is there's this concept called scheduling. And that's where you have a, um, like a node that can accept a certain amount of, um, of uh, containers. Uh, but maybe the node has... Uh, a specification that's that's like a, uh, it has GPU processor or something like that, and not everything is GPU. Scheduler uh, is uh, going to have to do placement of workload for you, and depending on what's available or other rules, and these type of things can be pretty complex. Um, in the Kubernetes, uh, they have uh, two ways to customize Kubernetes itself. So that you can um, you can make a different decision, like based on your hardware or just your company's policy. Maybe there's a uh, something where you you're not allowed to place certain type of code on the same box because of some compliance reason or whatever. And um, so there's a scheduler framework, uh, which is a Go SDK. Like you can like write write code in Go to change the logic of Kubernetes, right? Another way is a uh, thing that uh, this replaced, which was called extender, which was like a webhook process. And so webhook is an architecture that uh, allows callbacks basically via JSON and HTTP. So the framework is great, but it um, basically requires you to rebuild Kubernetes scheduler in order to change the functionality. 
because uh, basically it's a, it's a library import. And uh, so there's some advantages of the scheduler framework because, because it's in the same process, you can access the cache. There's a lot of metadata inside of, um, of a set of Kubernetes about the state of various things. And uh, so that's very nice to have local. And also you can use any feature that could possibly be used in Kubernetes. Like there's no constraints whatsoever. The problem of anything that's compiled in, and this is common with all vendor software, is that everyone wants to be a plugin inside of this thing. <laughs> so endless maintenance. So uh, I, you won't be able to see something, but I'll just read some off here. Node affinity and you know, for things that would like to be close to each other. Um, you have things I want to know where the volumes are and, and schedule according to that. Uh, you know, uh, some Azure-based or Google Cloud-based uh, scheduling features. So it can be a lot to maintain, and uh, and it can be very complex in um, in uh, like edge case clouds where it's not like a, um, a popular enough cloud. Like say you have a large company like in Taiwan, you may have they have a, their own internal cloud. They may have some different requirements. Um, so besides uh, compiling in, you can also do something like a webhook, and then then you can offload just like normal remote service uh, to um, to customize the scheduler. But there's some problems with this because when something is on the other side of a network, it's hard to stop it. Like so, let's say you you started to do a scheduling process, and now it's going <laughs> do 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 do, but then it's not local, it's, it's much harder to stop something or even know it stopped when it's not on the same uh, process. If you think about this in Go, in Go we have a context API, right? We have deadline context, cancel context, I can do something like defer context, you know, anything like that. And so just in my local function I have a lot of control and feedback, I can use channels, but when you get to the other side of a network you, you know, it's normal network problem. It's not special to the Kubernetes, but it's just a fact of life. And the cache is difficult. You don't want to push the entire Kubernetes model across the network every single time you make a, f a function call. That would be too much overhead. So it may have to make its own calls to an API server and start you know, moving JSON back and forth to try to synchronize its cache with the real life. So it's a lot more work. Um, so I worked with uh, two people, Kensai Nakata and Kante Yin. Uh, Ken Kensai is uh, in, uh, in Kyoto and, Ka and Kante is in, um, in Shanghai area. And basically we're like, uh, so Kensai actually started this project for WebAssembly integration based on work that he did personally for his company, like by one person, uh, just to prove that you could use uh, WebAssembly to do this instead of these remote things. And I was very impressed with that actually. And it, it inspired me to work with him. <laughs> um, but basically uh, it gives you a better, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. So you're still, the, the host is, remember the scheduler process itself, which has the cache and all of the state of the various things. And this is running in that process. And as long as you have functions that are uh, callbacks back and forth, your code can have a fairly rich experience, even though it was not developed uh, by the Kubernetes authors and, um, and not even built at the same time as the Kubernetes thingy. Uh, Wazero is the name of the uh, runtime that I work on, uh, but I've also worked on, actually if you go to this project, you can see code from the crypt all over <laughs> uh, because I worked on this. Okay, thanks. So anyway, um, at the end of the day, for backend technology, WebAssembly is a good extension model. And so uh, you can distribute binaries to just a regular file. Just like uh, if you're familiar with Java, Java has like jars and things. It's just moving moving the code around. And, um, and it, it gives you an alternative to trying to push everything into the same binary and also can help with the availability the problems that are inherent with our remote services. So with the time available, I'll talk uh, briefly about container architecture. And so if people are here have worked with containers before, 
uh, you'll know that um, container like Docker is intended for a specific operating system and uh, architecture. So like uh, Linux and AMD64 or ARM64, things like this, right? And sometimes the building of those images can be difficult because there will be platform dependencies. Like it maybe needs a specific version of glibc or some OpenSSL or some other thing on the, on the host image. Uh, one thing that's interesting about WebAssembly is that there is no operating system for WebAssembly. Uh, so, and if you believe that, that means that if you're able to compile something to WebAssembly, you have removed its platform de dependencies. <laughs> Because uh, logically, it must, uh, uh, because it is, is, has none. And so the cool thing there is that with WebAssembly, when you think of it containers, is that if you can compile something to WebAssembly, then you can run it on another platform, uh, as long as that platform can run WebAssembly. So I've, I've found this very handy for things like Windows, where oftentimes people don't make a Windows build. So you, as long as you can run a, a WebAssembly, it's actually easier than Docker, frankly, because uh, Docker works differently in web Windows. Um, and uh, I don't have too much time to go into the nitty gritty here, but um, it, uh, you'll, has, you'll see these slides and, um, and there, there's gonna be some uh, interest uh, anecdotes uh, to get back to. But because we're talking to Go programmers, I'm just going to just whiz through this part. Uh, the one thing is, is that the key thing to keep in mind is that a WebAssembly is a runtime, like Docker is a runtime. So if you build a container image uh, to run a WebAssembly binary, uh, you're just gonna run whatever the binary is for the WebAssembly runtime. Like the one I work on is was zero, there's also wasm time and wasmer. And then the name of the file, wasm file instead of the name of the, the container image. Like so, it's just it's a very similar model. Even though it's a virtual machine and not container, it's it's a way to run workloads. But it's a limited model. Um, it has a POSIX layer, uh, which is which is familiar for like opening files and reading and writing to them. But there's only about 44 usable system calls, where normally there would be hundreds. So not all features work in WebAssembly. So don't expect that WebAssembly will do everything that containers can do. The reason why I'm mentioning even this section is that there's a lot of marketing saying they're the same thing. <laughs> so I just want you to have some reference to come back to in case you hear about containers. So at the end of the day, WebAssembly is a lightweight virtual machine. So it can feel m in many ways like a container and you can actually use it like a container runtime. So there is a relationship between containers and WebAssembly in that way. Let's go into application architecture. Now, there's two ways. Uh, well, first thing is WebAssembly, like I said before, is embeddable. And it lets you do things that you can normally do in programming, but uh, a different way. So um, there's two main ways to interact with uh, code uh, in Go or any other programming language. Uh, that is not part of like a normal imported library. One is to fork a process, a subprocess like uh, OS exec or something like that. And then another thing is called f FFI, foreign functions. And in, in Go, there's this thing called CGO. So basically these are the two ways that, that you, can, you can drive around code. And WASI, which is the system call layer for WebAssembly, has the ability to uh, execute things that are just like shell programs. So like DC raw is a image rendering uh, program, like a main main dot C. I mean, I mean like stuff like that, right? And you can you can pass arguments just like you would in OS exec, but it doesn't actually fork a process. Uh, it actually is, is running in the process, and uh, it, it virtualizes things um, like uh, file access. And, uh, and then it has to copy things in and out of this um, sandbox memory. And so it works in this model. And this allows you to do things like fake the file underneath of it so it never even touches the file. Um, and th those are some cool tricks that you can use in, uh, um, in WebAssembly. And um, one uh, f a famous use case of WebAssembly in Go is SQLite. So there is a Go SQLite, which is a CGO, but some people cannot use that. Um, so there is actually, you know, Chris has a Go SQLite 3, which you can try. And that's a very cool thing because you can embed actually the real SQLite code into your Go app. 
Like it's the actual same source code. So all of the good quality stuff that you like about SQLite in your Go app. And so it's so pretty cool. And I have some, uh, in the slide deck, some things about how it looks internally, which is a little bit different than normal uh, Seago integration. But as I was told at the time, you know, can't go into so many details. One minute, right? So anyway, um, let's go to the last part, uh, which is programming. So, like, uh, programming with uh, WebAssembly is a new thing uh, for a lot of people, but you use your normal programming language. It's just different um, arguments. So, like in Go, in Go 21, which will be out next week or two weeks, WASI P1 is the operating system. Yeah, so, and then the architecture is WASM. So, you can use that to compile. And you can also use TinyGo to compile. And you can use profilers which is cool. So you could actually see what, what the same like math.c will look like with, uh, uh, versus what the same program in Go would look like uh, because both of them can run in a WebAssembly. And so that's kind of cool. But I would say that w programming WebAssembly is a work in progress, and there's, uh, but it's getting better. I have some notes here on the slides that you'll see about some status. But the best thing to take, take away is that Go 121 will be out very soon. You're going to be able to play with this very easily. Um, so it's kind of good to start now, because <laughs> if you started last year, it would have been much harder. And that's basically it. Um, I will distribute the slides. Here are the go-to points. And uh, if you like this stuff or are interested, the, the runtime library is Wazero. And if you see that project on GitHub, just uh, you know, do the star thing. <laughs> um, and we also are on the Gopher Slack channel. And there's some information about how to get on the Slack from our project page, too, uh, which you can say hi to the people who are working on these things. So everything that I talked, talked about, those people are on our Slack channel, and you can ask any, anybody those questions. So these are all, all things that we work on. So anyway, thank you for your patience. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there's any time for questions. You have time for three questions. Three questions. You can speak it in Chinese. I'll translate. So. Any questions? Wait. Hi. Hi, Angel. And I am very curious about the WebAssembly with plugin. So I'm curious about how to use the WebAssembly plugin. Uh, I mean, how to adapt that with our normal CI CD approach, such as a blueprint, uh, sorry, blueprint or rolling upgrade. Because to my best knowledge, if we use this kind of uh, approach, we will to deploy our uh, core or feature change just gradually. But however, if we use WebAssembly, that will seem that all change will be affect directly, right? So how to you know adapt land to that smoothly? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I think that you're still talking about um, you know entropy. You're 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 putting a change into the system. Uh, it's just how you're doing it is differently, right? So at the end of the day, a lot of these things are going to be driven by a config file change or change to a repository. So where, where that WebAssembly file is located uh, would end up being like a field in configuration. Uh, so what I would say is that while it's still early days for people to make like products that are specific about rolling back this or that, at the end of the day, it's a file that, that must be deployed somehow. <laughs> And that will have a manifestation in a config. So um, I would go with that first. And, um, and also remember that you can start earlier than uh, deployment, too, because these are, are code that can be benchmarked and, and practiced. Uh, uh, so there's, there's multiple ways. But yeah, think, think first about how it manifests. And that would be a file and a config file. And so just like if you are changing another config, a significant config change, you'll have a, another same problem. Uh, so you can think of it like a new version. Even though the binary is the same, you can still think of it as like a new version of the deployment. Yeah. So you can, you can maybe couple those together somehow. Yeah. Hey, hi, Adrian. Uh, um, I want to ask 
a question like um, if my web assembly modules require file system level access, like writing to a file or read from a file, etc. Um, do you provide any ways to have some kind of uh, virtual file system or file system interface where I can work on instead of, um, you know, I just take a look at your repo and it seems you are using Cisco all of the f uh, file system access things. So is it possible to have like um, a file system interface where we can adapt any kind of, you know, maybe network file system for the web assembly parts of the code to run on? Yeah, so the uh, question is, okay, if WebAssembly is a virtual machine and it has a sandbox, which means it's not supposed to do everything unless you permit it, uh, I have code that needs to read and write files or thing. So in, in the case of Wazero runtime, we have a pluggability via um, uh, normal fs.fs uh, file system, which does not support write, but it, it is a read-only file system. We also have the OS file, and uh, one hour ago I was still working on our internal full power interface, <laughs> which which should be out uh, soon for arbitrary use. Yeah, you can change it. You can meet this shy one over here. <laughs> Thank you. 